Lord Jesus, I just praise you and I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we would uh, ready our hearts to receive your word, Lord, and Lord, to put it into action. Father God, um, yeah, we just want to read today's understanding what you were saying in context to your people and what you're what that spiritual eternal truth is saying to us, Lord, in the way that we need to live, in the way that we need to engage uh, with you, Lord, and engage with um, those that are not of you. Father God, Lord, that you would continue to teach us, continue to guide us, and Lord, that we would be people that love you in action, not just in word, but in deed. And Lord, we, we thank you. Praise you for your your word, the Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, Deuteronomy 7, beginning in verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and to occupy, uh, he will clear away many nations ahead of you. And he's going to list off about seven different nations. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. So there's a couple of things in there. You must completely destroy them. Um, We'll finish the sentence. Make no treaties with them, and show them no mercy. Okay. So that's pretty direct and to the point. And sometimes, you know, in our Western thinking, we have a problem with this. Why? Because we're very Christianized. What, what do I mean by that? Well, whether we like to follow Jesus or not, we like to imply, you know, uh, put the rules that Jesus made up. We like to say, you know, Jesus said to have mercy. Jesus said to be gracious, you know, gracious and, and um, to be kind, not to hurt people. You know, we, we are pacifists, right? Um, we're the ones that picket and disagree with war. We get mad. Uh, we, we are the type of people these days that get mad when somebody hits back. You know, that's, that's the type of people we are. Um, but we have to go back into context, go back into it. And the, the main context that we have to look at is these people are living on a certain land, a land that God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, has promised to a certain people from, from ages past. And he says, now I'm going to give you that land. Okay, so there's another thing that we have to follow is that Scripture tells us That the world belongs to the Lord, to God Almighty, and everything in it. It's all His. It's His possession. He made it. And anything that we have made, His possession has made. Do you understand? So everything, in essence, belongs to Him. He tells us over and over, uh, and you can look these verses up. You know, it says that God owns all of the earth, all of the birds of the air, you know, it, it says he owns them all. You know, I don't know if this is true or not, but when I came to England and uh, I saw a swan in, in London uh, in one of the parks, and I said, oh, look at that beautiful swan. And the person with me said, did you know that the queen owns every swan? It's like, how, how, did, how does she own every swan? Well, they're here in, here in Britain, and they belong to her. I don't know if it's true or not. I've never really looked it up. But I just thought, whoa. But if, if the queen can own ev- any swan, can't the king of kings and the lord of lords say he owns what he created? By all means, he can. And it tells us that in Scripture. In fact, there's this psalm that I love, and I, I've stated it before. And the psalm pretty much states, this is my paraphrase version, uh, I the, I, the Lord, own everything in the earth. If I were hungry, I would not consult you. <laughs> you know, that's, he's, he's pretty much putting us in our place and saying, listen, uh, you can't solve any problem that I would ever have because I'm bigger than you. 
I own it all. It's all mine. So, you know, when we look at this, there's this land that God from ages past had said he owned. That's my land. And that land I will promise to Abraham. I made that promise to Isaac. I made that promise to Jacob and to Jacob's offspring, Israel. And now he's bringing them there and the eviction notice, the eviction notice is there saying it's time, time to take them out. So, you know, we, we come to this, but when we look at it and how it applies to us today, we're told a similar thing in the New Testament, not against people because Paul tells us we don't battle against flesh and blood. That's not who we're battling against. We're battling against principalities, against spiritual forces, dark forces that Jesus came to overcome. So what are we doing? We need to put sin in our lives to death. We need to put it to death once and for all. It can't be part of us anymore. We need to stop the evil that we have been doing. You know, and that, that goes for the Christian, the one that has come to Jesus Christ and trusts him uh, and the work that he did on the cross. Yes, we can still fail, but we have an advocate. We have someone that stands there for us and we can run to him and say, I messed up. Forgive me. I repent. I don't want to do it again. Give me the strength through your Holy Spirit not to do it again. Help me. Help me. But we need to do that action. And it says here in verse 2, when the Lord your God hands these nations over to you, so he renders them uh, incapable of fighting, and then he hands them over to the Israelites to actually, ha to actually win the fight, to win the fight. So the Lord does the work, he hands them over, and then they have to follow in obedience with the responsibility of taking them out in war and being obedient as they take them out in war. So we see this today with, with sin. Christ on the cross, on the work of the cross, overcame sin. He, he took away its power. That's what he did. He took away sin's power over us. We are not in bondage anymore. So as a Christian, God did the work, but we have to follow in obedience. I need to do what it says in the scripture, what Paul told us, what Peter told us, you know, we're told over and over again as uh, we're on the Wednesday nights, we're studying what Paul had told Timothy in his letters. And he says, Timothy, stay away from sin. It has no power over you, so don't give it power over you. Don't give it the power over you. Well, how do you do that? You stay away from it. You flee it. It has no power over you unless you give it the power to be over you. Or like Paul tells us not to go into bondage again. You know, you were set free as a slave through the work of Jesus Christ. Sin has no power over you. If you're a Christian and you're watching here today, sin has no power over you, but you can choose to let something overpower you. You know, the Son has set us free Stay free. Stay free by being obedient. God has handed it over to us, rendering it weak. And then, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, I, was, I remember one time I, I was watching like a cartoon or something and, and it had Dracula in it, right? And uh, they told him, listen, if you're in your house, they told the, the cartoon character, if you're in your house, Dracula can't come in unless you invite him in. So a vampire can't come in unless you invite him in, right? And um, so the guy's like, oh, okay, well, that'll be easy. But the thing is, is then the vampire tries to, you know, it was a funny cartoon. So the vampire starts trying to trick him to invite him in. 
<laughs> so he comes as the pizza guy or, you know, he comes as, you know, as every trick. And isn't that the way of temptation? Isn't that the way that sin likes to come? It doesn't come and say, hi, I'm sin. I'm here to kill you. Then we'd be like, no, 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 no. I want nothing to do with that. No, sin comes dressed up looking good, you know, looking, you know, promising you lots of things. So you have to know God's word so that you can say, no, you're not invited into my life. I don't want you. You got nothing to do with me. Go away. You have no power over me. You know, it could yell at you. It can threaten you. It could do all these different things, but it has no power over you. So you say, be gone. And then you flee. You be gone. The son has set us free. Stay free. Make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. Now verse 3, you must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and son marry, sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away. He's not just like, hey, don't intermarry with them. You got to stay pure, you know, like in the sense of like pure blooded and, you know, you got to have that uh, pride in your people and in your blood and, you know, all these different things. Um, like we, he wasn't, it wasn't about being ethnocentric. Uh, it was about being pure before the Lord. This is what he tells him in verse four, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols. For you are holy people. You belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. So you look at it and it says, hey, don't intermarry. So this would ultimately lead them into sin. You may not see the danger beforehand. You remember what I just said before, temptation, sin doesn't come telling you what it's, you know, I'm here to kill you. Spiritually, physically, I'm here to kill you. Of course, we'd say, no, you know, sin comes creeping in. You know, sin comes like something you want to marry. You need to ask yourself the question of when you begin an endeavor or when you're doing something. Where are you headed on the path that you are choosing? Where's it going to lead you? Where are you headed? Instead of just saying, ah, it'll be fine, and just going on, stopping and thinking about it and saying, where does this path lead? Where are we headed? Let's look on the road map called the Bible. Hmm, God tells me to stay away from that. If the Son has set you free, stay free. You know, so, it, and again, it's not about hiding yourself from those that, that um, don't think like you or aren't Christians. You know, oh, it's a non-Christian at the door. Yeah, but he has your Amazon package. Take it. No, it's, he, he's a non-Christian. I can tell. And you close the door behind you. Man, don't be a freak. You know, that's, that's not what the Lord is asking you to do. He's not asking you to be isolated. He's, he's telling you not to become contaminated as you walk in this world. So it's not about monkhood and living up on the top of a mountain and staying away from everybody. Oh, this is how I stay holy. No, you stay holy by communing with the Lord and being in this world, but not being part, taking part of this world. Does that mean you don't work a job or anything? No, that's not what I'm talking about. What you don't do is become like them, adopt their sin, their sin or what they're doing and say, oh, it's fine. It's okay. You watch your filters, the filters of your life. Keep them clean. And that living water can flow. Watch what you're doing. So it's not about hiding yourself. It's about it interacting, 
without marrying. Interacting without marrying into sin. So we can interact, you know, most of us work, including me, I work uh, different jobs with people that uh, don't care anything about my faith or Jesus Christ and some of the things that they do are not good. I choose not to take part in the things that they do that are not good. You know, um, there are some really lovely people that I meet on the job site that I actually love and I share uh, the truth of Jesus Christ with them. Um, they may reject it, but we have a respect for each other. I respect them because they were made in the image of God. And I pray they respect me because I treat them kind. And I treat them the way Jesus Christ has asked me to treat them. So it's about interacting without marrying into sin. And how do we do that? Well, we were told that in chapter 6 of uh, Deuteronomy. It's by loving the Lord, choosing to love the Lord. It's by being grateful to Him, and that's part of love, being grateful for what He's done. And then it's by obeying Him, walking in the way that I'm supposed to walk. It's, it's by not becoming like the world, but letting the Lord change me. How do I do that? Well, by spending time with Him, by reading the Bible, by letting that Bible start to make its way into my heart, and then by living it out. Loving the Lord, being grateful to Him, obeying Him. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, read this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. One of the things that I find as I interact with people is the subtle things that that try to uh, come into my life, like attitudes or views on somebody. You know, you might, the Lord is telling us to love all people, but you may be working with somebody who doesn't like certain somebody over there, and then you take on, you can take on their um, complaints on what that, who that person is, and I don't like them or whatever. But if you're in Christ, you're going to love them both. If you could tell, I still have a little bit of cold, and um, my my throat's tickling now. So, um, yeah, um, so it's about not not taking on those subtle things, those attitudes. Maybe you work with somebody that likes to complain about everything. Don't get caught up in their complaining. In fact, maybe even remind them of things that they could be grateful for or just stay quiet. You know, it might be somebody that likes to, uh, to use foul language. Well, don't join in their foul language. Show them that you are different and they will ask you, huh, why are you different? And then you can teach them the way to life, the way to Christ. Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to have a sip of water. So, <clears throat> so then we, we move along. So don't compromise to make others happy. Make God happy. You understand? Um, it, it's very simple. Uh, you are set apart for him, so don't contaminate yourself. And in one sentence, it's, it's like this. Follow the one you love. Well, if you love everything else, you'll follow all that. But if you, fo if you love the Lord, you'll follow him. Follow the one you love. Like Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. What were Jesus' commands? Well, they were very simple. He broke down the Ten Commandments into two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. 
And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So we follow after him and we follow his commands because we love him. Follow the one you love. So then he says, for you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. So separation or to be set apart, not isolation, but just separated, set apart for him. And, and to be set apart and to stay there means a place of safety within, near the Lord. You know, him protecting you from the evils that we choose at times, thinking of silly things that we do. And it also means blessing. And, you know, like, we'll, we'll cover this in a little while, but how do, you, how do you get blessings? Well, you stay where the blessing is. It's very simple, you know. How, well, how do I get blessed? Well, you stay where the blessing is. As Christians, we stay near Christ. We walk in the light as he is in the light. You know, Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. He did a work for us. When there was no way to be right with God, when there was a debt bigger than what I could pay on my life and on your life and on all of our lives, Jesus Christ came and paid that debt with the perfect blood of the spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, I only have to trust that. I only have to put my trust in what God did on that cross and that three days later, he overcame death in the grave and believe that and say, Jesus Christ is Lord and then follow after that. If you love me, you will obey my commands. Follow after that. And he makes me new. And he puts me on a path of blessing and I just have to stay on that path just following after him. Now listen to, listen to verse 7 and verse 8, you know. Uh, the Lord tells them why he's doing this. Why is he delivering this land to them? Why is he standing strong for them? Why does he fight for them? Why is, you know, he's giving them the, the secret to why God is acting on their behalf. He says, the Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations. For you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply, here's the big secret, that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. the being over all. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations I am giving you today. So you know, we see a couple things in there. And it echoes what, what we've been told from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It echoes that. I was not chosen by the Lord. You were not chosen by the Lord because of how uh, clever you were or how good looking you are or how awesome everybody thinks you are or just because, you know, you're really good at making money, or you're really bad at making money, or whatever your skill set might be. God didn't choose you because of that. He didn't choose you because you are, you, you have this fabulous mind and you can remember charts and everything, or you have these incredible hands that can heal others, or he didn't choose you because, man, you just dress really nice. He didn't choose you because of that. 
In fact, he didn't choose you because of you. He loves you. That's why he extends his gift of Jesus Christ on the cross to all. Because he loves us. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. So when we can understand that, as Christians, when I can understand that, that God loves me, He loves me, not some, you know, kind of weak way or anything like that. No, when I understand it's by grace, by an unmerited gift that I am saved, and it's by no work on me, by, by me or through me, then all of a sudden, a weight is lifted off my shoulders. Why? Because it's God Almighty who saved me. I could never save me. It's God Almighty who saved you. And it's not about your performance. You may be a failure of a Christian. God loves you. Does he want you to walk right? Yes. He wants you to walk correctly. He wants you to be obedient to him. Why? Because that is the path of blessing. The heavenly father wants to bless the children that are called by his name. So a loving father finds it easy to bless their children, which they love, who love them back and obey them. I find it so easy to bless my girls when they've just been good girls. You know what I mean? It's like, well, well, you can't watch TV because, you know, you've done this and you've done that, and you're not allowed to do this because that's hard. It, it makes it difficult. But you see what he says there. He says, but he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. That's not talking about children, his children. Those are talking about the people that reject his offer of sonship and, and becoming a son or daughter to him, and they say, I don't want you, I want nothing to do with you, get away from me. In fact, I am your enemy, I am against you and everything that you want to do, and I'm against your people, and I'm going against it all. And the Lord says, okay, well, he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. Those who reject him. But to those that love him, he is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Man, that's cool. That's good. So, he started, he loved us, and all he asks is for us to love him back. You know, to be grateful towards him, to obey him. He loved us first. And he's like, it's not about your performance or anything like that. He's not a God that I have to appease to accept me. I'm already accepted. Now, act like a son or daughter of the king. Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations I'm giving you today. You know, something that I have written down here, it says, but if someone doesn't want to be a son or daughter and they want to be an enemy, the Lord will treat them like an enemy. And he will be almighty God who is always victorious. That's all he's doing. He's just being who he is, just revealing his character. He's always victorious, and he will be victorious on our behalf, or he will be victorious against us. But at the end of the day, you choose. It's up to you or me. So what are we going to choose? Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for your scripture, Father God. Lord, I thank you um, for the, the simple things you teach us in your scripture. And Lord, that we would be people that uh, don't just isolate ourselves, Lord, but Lord, we would be people that interact, but don't intermarry with 
uh, the things that we shouldn't. We don't commit ourselves where we shouldn't be committed. But Lord, uh, that we would love you and we would want to be called your sons or your daughters. And Lord, that you would, you would bless us, Lord. And that you would continue to walk with us and speak to us. And Lord, that we would do the same, that we would continue to read your word, allow you to speak to us through it that we would continue to speak to you in prayer. And Lord, as we go into a time of prayer now, Lord, that, um, yeah, that you would hear and we know that you hear us when we, when we cry out to you. And Lord, that you would, you would act, that we would see you and uh, we would see your mighty hand. And we just pray this in Jesus' name, amen.